Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Joanne Emery. Uh, I lead the webinar events team at IHS Infinetics, and I want to welcome you to our webinar. We've got a, a really, really solid, good presentation prepared for you, and our focus is on an area that I know is of uh, great concern to the service providers and, and to customers all around the world. That's the issue of security. Um, and specifically, we, we are going to be looking at security solutions as networks move to virtualization. And our title today is Delivering Security Everywhere with SDN and NFE. Our webinar is co-presented by the IHS Infinetics team and our partner, Juniper Networks. Uh, we'll get the presentation started in just a minute, but before we start, I want to just go over some of the functions available um, for you and also how, let you know how you can participate on the discussion. So first of all, the console that we have preloaded um, for you that you're seeing on your screen can be customized for your own preference. So you can move or resize the windows that you're seeing. If you want to maximize your, the slides for viewing, just click the top right corner of that window. You can also drag the bottom right corner of any window that you're seeing to resize that. Uh, you should see a number of buttons running along the bottom of the console, and these all do contain more features for you. An area I want to call out is our resource list. Uh, that's the button that looks like a little file folder. This is where you can find a downloadable version of the slide deck for our presentation. In addition to that slide deck, we, we have a lot of other information in the resource uh, list for you. Uh, we have a new IHS Infinetics white paper on delivering security virtually everywhere with SDN and NFE. Um, you can download that. We also have links to even more information and solutions, all related to security needs. And all that material can be accessed uh, and taken away uh, right from the console. So I encourage you to check that resource link out. Also, if you have any technical difficulty, you can click on the Help widget. That's the button with the question mark icon. And, and you can find some common uh, answers to common technical issues right there. And now some ways you can participate today. You're going to see a live uh, Twitter feed on your console, so you can easily view and tweet right from the webinar. We're using a hashtag NFE security on this webinar. Um, also, on the webinar, we will have an audience poll for you, so we want your input. Uh, this is a, a good way for you to see how your experiences stack up with your peers. So uh, watch for that, and please participate in the poll. And the last item I want to mention is our Q&A session. Directly after our presentation, the panel is going to be answering your questions. We want your input. Um, we'd, we'd love to get your experiences, your comments, and your questions anytime during the presentation. So please use that Q&A box located on the left side of your screen. Uh, you can submit your questions anytime during the presentation. We'll get to as many um, live on the presentation as possible. And any questions we can't answer, uh, we'll follow up with you after, after the webinar. So with that, um, I'm going to uh, just uh, introduce our panel, and we'll get the presentation started. So first of all, leading our discussion today is Jeff Wilson. Jeff is Research Director for Cybersecurity Technology at IHS Infinetics. Uh, we also have Wayne Chung with us, and Wayne is the Director of Product Marketing for SDN and NFE at Juniper Networks. And um, with that, I am going to get right to the presentation. I'm going to turn the controls over to Jeff. So Jeff, to you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Joanne. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Uh, so like Joanne said, what we're going to really talk about today is the move to virtualization and the integration of security with uh, SDN and NFE. So for once, I don't have to start my presentation with a bunch of shock and awe about threats. Really, this is going to be a discussion about uh, architecture and applications and not so much about the threats themselves, although Wayne will touch a little bit on some of the unique threats. Uh, in virtualized environments as, as we move on here. Um, but it all starts with the move to the cloud. Uh, as the cloud on the bench says, you know, it all started when he was adopted. Um, and, and the move to cloud computing, cloud networking, it's a fundamental shift, right? This touches everything. Users, networks, devices, uh, it impacts every network service out there. Um, and so everyone in the industry, not just security, but everyone had to step back and say, all right, what, is this, what does this really mean for us? And it really boils down to three key concepts. When, you move, when you're moving to a cloud architecture, what you're really looking to gain access to is flexibility that you didn't have before in a, in a fixed vendor-specific hardware environment, uh, scalability that we couldn't even imagine, uh, and programmability, the ability to change things and even change things on the fly. And so what we want to talk about is how do you apply these cloud 
techniques, advantages to security, creating truly flexible, scalable, programmable infrastructure, uh, and then leveraging that infrastructure to deliver a new type of security solution. That's, that's really what we're gonna talk about. So, defining some, some key concepts up front. Um, if, you, uh, if you're new to uh, this whole topic, um, you know, the, the two main things we're gonna talk about are SDN and NFE. SDN is software defined networks, right? The goal of SDN is really simple, it can be uh, in two statements. Uh, it is to decouple network control from forwarding and make it directly programmable. So separating control and forwarding and then abstracting the underlying infrastructure from applications and network services, right? This is how you create that cloud-like interface in the network to uh, allow for scalability, uh, flexibility, uh, programmability. So it, there are ultimately in an SDN architecture, there's some sort of uh, control layer sitting in the middle. Uh, SDN controller orchestration tools, uh, OpenFlow, um, that communicate both down to the infrastructure layer, which is all of the old network devices and services uh, in security, things like firewall, uh, but also switching, routing, um, you know, WAN acceleration, any type of uh, network service, and then communicating above and attaching those services through APIs to specific business applications. So ultimately what you can create is this really flexible environment where you can attach uh, network services, network devices, through the control layer up to the application layer to specific applications. And then this also will interface in the control side uh, to things like OpenStack to also coordinate this, these network services and business applications with uh, compute and storage management. So it's not just what's going on in the network, but also making uh, compute and storage resources flexibly available as well. So that's SDN. So how is that different from NFV? Um, so SDN is really an architecture, uh, whereas um, NFV is a concept, right? The, the concept of NFV is uh, in the old world of networks, uh, and particularly in the old world of large carrier networks, uh, there were a lot of standalone network appliances uh, running on specific hardware uh, in, with closed uh, operating systems and software to run the different functions of a carrier network. Uh, router, session border controller, WAN acceleration, testing and monitoring, NAT, firewalls, all of this stuff is uh, individual hardware components that was uh, highly specialized and proprietary. So once we started virtualizing things, um, the, the concept of network function virtualization came up, which is why can't we take all of these functions, which are all essentially written in software, and run them on standard high volume servers, standard high volume storage, uh, standard um, bare metal high volume switches and routers, and then leverage orchestration and automation, things like SDN, um, to take uh, all of these services and run them flexibly in a, in a large network environment without being tied to specific hardware. So uh, NFV, network function virtualization, leverages the concept of SDN for orchestration and control, but is really just really just the idea that we can take all of this specialized hardware and, and turn it into virtual appliances that can run on high volume, um, common off the shelf hardware. But stepping back a little bit, this really begs the question of, you know, what's the deal with virtualization? And really this all comes from um, this initial uh, server virtualization move. And server virtualization, um, uh, is widely adopted around the world. Just about every company uh, of any size has probably touched server, server virtualization. So the sort of the timeline is uh, we figured out that there was some benefit or value to taking this hardware that we had and leveraging, um, leveraging availability of hardware. In some cases, uh, physical servers were underutilized. In other cases, they were overutilized. So what if we could balance that out um, run multiple applications virtually in, in separate instances on a single hardware platform um, so that we could make more efficient use of, of our hardware. From serv uh, server virtualization, we started thinking, all right, well, can't we do this for compute and storage? And the answer was, of course, yes. Uh, once we have virtualized servers, compute, and storage, then we can look at starting to build 
virtualized entire data centers. Uh, once we have a virtualized data center, we can say, all right, we have this virtualized infrastructure. Um, let's apply some, you know, some specialized uh, programming. Let's build out some applications. Let's build some individual applications. In the beginning, this was proprietary um, to take advantage of this virtualized compute and storage. <clears throat> and we had the first sort of standalone virtualized services. Um, once we introduced open standards and platforms for control, uh, orchestration, SDN, we apply that to the software-defined data center, you can start building a range of cloud services in a much more uh, common way, which allows you to build them more quickly, uh, a, a more diverse set of solutions. So we have this kind of software-defined data center, cloud data center, and the emergence of mass market cloud services. Um, once we take this concept, which has largely been confined to the wiring closet or the data center, and extend it into the rest of the network, in particular in the carrier network, we end up virtualizing the rest of that big group of network elements that are in large carrier networks, you know, this concept of NFV. Now we move to the world of full network virtualization and this next generation of telco infrastructure, which ultimately is reaching for that cloud goal, right, of you know, flexibility, scalability, and programmability. And all of this is because in order to stay competitive, um, providers of all types and even IT organizations within uh, a company are, are looking to deploy applications in, in days or weeks uh, and not months or years. And that's what this change really drives the, the opportunity to do is um, have a new idea for an application and have the infrastructure for that application built out and deployed in, in days or weeks, maybe in, a, in uh, three months instead of in 18 months, uh, like it would, would have taken five years ago to build out and deploy the infrastructure for a new business application. So that's sort of the architecture and conceptual side. So what's actually going on in the real world? This is some uh, data excerpted from interviews of uh, some of the largest service providers around the globe about their plans to deploy SDN and NFV. Um, the drivers that they echoed back to us were what you would expect. They're, um, they're looking to scale services up and down quickly, to quickly add new services, to reduce their cost, um, to optimize networks in real time, to simplify provisioning. These are all cloud scale benefits. And they're the reason why many of these providers are moving very quickly to deploy uh, SDN and NFE. And as you can see from this timeline, this is where we are. This, we are way past theory and in, into real-world deployments in data centers, in carrier networks, and even the development of enterprise solutions. Um, in 2015, we got 15 to 20 or more uh, commercial deployments today, um, many operators deploying one or two use cases to start with. And the most important point I, I'll, I'll hit is the reason we're talking about security in this webinar is because in many cases, one of those one or two use cases is a, is a security application. And that's because uh, security is, is largely ready to go today in a virtualized environment. So what does this really mean for security? Um, somebody needs the ability to see into and enforce security policies on east-west traffic in the data center. That was the first problem that server virtualization introduced. The firewall sitting in front of uh, you know, and your other security tools sitting in front of a bank of servers, now all of a sudden uh, they're uh, 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 virtualized servers, you have instances, you have traffic running east-west never coming out to the firewall. So there was this opportunity for new threats that could evade existing solutions because the traffic was never seen. Um, so virtual appliances and architectures were needed to protect virtualized infrastructure. Um, but it's not just protection. There's really an opportunity to develop innovative services both within the data center and in carrier networks to deliver, you know, flexible, on-demand, programmable services that are attached to specific applications. So uh, security product manufacturers have been on top of this, um, been developing virtual appliances and virtualized security solutions. Really, I started tracking them like eight years ago. So. Um, Compared to other areas, other network elements that could be virtualized and integrated with SDN and NFV, uh, security has a huge head start because 
like I said, the first problem that a lot of companies ran into when they started virtualizing servers was, uh-oh, I don't have visibility into that traffic anymore, and I don't have security controls for the east-west traffic. So they, they started coming to their security vendors immediately. And so, um, you know, this is also some survey data from a survey of large hosting providers around the world about their plans for security and virtualized security in particular. Um, and many of them are looking to deploy a wide range of security solutions, hardware appliances, virtual security appliances, and still running individual instances of software on a, on a single virtual machine, uh, all of it, following a, a typical defense in depth model, but also, um, you know, needing architectural flexibility and needing solutions that support every type of, they don't want to be locked into one way of doing anything, and they, they require solutions that can operate in all three of those basic modes. And then on the left side, we asked, all right, so what, from a security standpoint, which technologies are you actually investing in deploying virtual appliances? And the basic story is the closer the security solution is to the actual application, uh, the more likely it is today to be sold as a virtual appliance. So things like web application firewall, mail security gateway, web security gateway, um, security solutions that sit in front of a single application. Um, and that, of course, makes a lot of sense. If you go out to Microsoft Azure or, or, or Amazon, um, it's very easy to find a hosting, a web hosting service that comes bundled with a web application firewall that you can turn on right when you spin up the, uh, the web application or web server. Um, in order to deploy a virtualized firewall, you have to have more of your infrastructure in the cloud or virtualized. But those solutions are available today already, and there are plenty of virtual firewall and UTM and next-gen firewall appliances, or even virtualized DDoS mitigation solutions. So all of this stuff is available today, and providers are looking at, and in many cases, deploying uh, all of it. And just to hammer that point home, um, we've been tracking shipments, like I said, for about eight years of virtual appliances. In 2015, we're over $700 million worth of security, you know, threat mitigation, virtual security appliances uh, being purchased and deployed uh, with strong growth coming. So this is a, a solution that's widely available from a bunch of different manufacturers, a wide range of technologies already available and, and working today. So before I pass it over to Wayne to talk uh, more specifically about um, uh, the, the integration of SDN and NFE and virtual security appliances, I wanted to ask a little poll question, and that is, how would you characterize your company's current interest in SDN and NFE? Are you in the education mode? Uh, are you evaluating solutions and vendors? Are you already in trials uh, or production? So I'll give you just a moment to answer the question. Um, I don't know if Wayne, if you had anything you wanted to jump in and say uh, before you get started on your uh, on your section. Yeah, Jeff, great great job today in presenting an overview of where we are in the marketplace. You know, I I think I find that the most important uh, aspect of it isn't so much the destination as to where we all want to be, but sort of this journey that we're going along the way, right? And we're, we're really at a very interesting and exciting time. You know, you showcase that where we're getting very much past the proof of concepts in, into the commercial deployments of such technologies. And I think we're really at the apex of it and the, really some of the most exciting times along this journey. Excellent. All right, so let's take a look. Uh, good. Well, hey, it looks like we decided to do this webinar at just the right time. So uh, about a third of our audience is just starting to educate themselves on the topic. Another 25% evaluating solutions and vendors. That's great. Interesting, though, that almost uh, you know, over 15% production deployment already in progress. I saw on the some of the names on the attendees list, I know we have some large carriers that are definitely in progress here, so that's not too surprising. Excellent. Uh, well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pass it over to Wayne, and Wayne is going to talk specifically about uh, solutions that are available today. Wayne? Okay. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, welcome, everybody. I'm very uh, excited to talk to you here about security solutions in the SDN and virtualized world. And with that, we'll jump right into it. So as we look into this world of virtualizing security, 
we're, all, we're, we're still faced with still many of the traditional security risks that you are um, experiencing in, in your networks today. But how does, in, in, how does the virtual environment impact you in terms of these traditional security risks? So let's take a few as an example. Targeted malware, right? The threats are constantly evolving. You're often required to keep your databases very fresh with threat feeds that come with new, um, new threat vectors that might attack your network. So in that regard, in a virtualized world, that means having the right design for where you keep your database for um, um, threats is going to be a very important way to manage the proliferation of virtual machines across your network. So something to strongly think about. You know, common theft drives, um, some, some drive thefts. Those are very common still, something to still think about. Uh, data loss as your data spreads across virtualized machines. You have to have the right process and procedures in place to manage this loss and understand where those are coming from. So a, a much more dynamic environment to deal with. If you're in a world where you have audits um, in your network, whether HIPAA or um, you know retail or whatnot, PCI, there's a bunch of different audits that might creep scope in terms of a virtualized world. Think of the example where you may have had a host machine where virtual machines that ran on it did not require audit before, but now you place a certain virtual machine that requires audit scope within the dimensions of that. So that might mean the other virtual machines that you have on that host become also part of that audit scope. So again, having the right process and procedures in place for managing this is going to be an, an important element of managing this dynamic world. Missing security updates and patches. Now, this is an area where now if, if you have virtual machines that migrate and move between different host machines, are you keeping up consistently across the board, across your host machines and hypervisors and, and virtual machines, the right level of security patches and updates? Uh, as in, in a dynamic world, this is going to be very important, again, to have the, the policies in place for that. And then we'll touch upon this one very heavily, is the reliance on traditional barriers. Um, you know, traditional large firewalls at the edge of a data center to protect a whole host of machines. But in a dynamic environment, the, the challenges we're going to have to deal with that moving and evolving type of um, data center and keeping up with those um, those configurations and those um, those elements in that environment is going is, is going to place an additional challenge on traditional firewalls. So what we're really looking at is how do we manage this in this in this migration to a virtual world with these traditional risks? But we also are going to be confronted with new security risks as we evolve into this virtualized environment. Accelerated provisioning, the whole focus around SDN and NSE is to allow you to move very quickly, roll out new services very quickly and agilely, but that also means an accelerated provisioning model. So how does your security policies keep up with this? And this is where automation becomes a very key element to being, to being able to keep up with um, the changes in your network through programmable capabilities, take out that manual process in your in your um, in your procedures mixed trust workflows you know we're going to be mixing again things that might require audit and things that don't require audit into workloads so are you do you have the right skill sets of people to be able to deal with that so that sort of leads into the next one which is the six security uh, left to non-traditional security staff where this is more of a process and procedure perspective that if you're going to be mixing workloads on a common host, you might have non-traditional security staff accessing that host. And that, that means if you have a mixed virtual machine with security elements um, that have to be applied, that means broadly training more staff for security procedures. Um, so again, taking sort of a, a uh, a policy approach to this is going to be a very key element. Um, the other area is migrations, right? Moving machines around, maintenance of this. Um, you'll have to have the right tool sets in place to handle your change move ads. Um, is your host machine secure anymore? Is your hypervisor integrity um, still in place? 
So having the right security management elements to, to help you through this virtualized model is, is another key element. Lastly, we talk about poor visibility and control. Having the telemetry of your network to be able to make those analytical decisions, analyzing that in real time, and then taking the proper action as you move in this dynamic virtualized world um, is going to be a, 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 an essential piece to keeping the security concerns out of your network. So just this, really just some old things to think about and some new things to think about. Now let's take a look at what, what does a virtual appliance do for me? Why is it critical in this world of virtualization? If you look at a traditional model on the left, right, you have a large firewall maybe at the edge of your network data center. It has now a larger responsibility. A larger responsibility translates to much more complex configurations. That centralized firewall device now has to worry about, you know, applications and the, and the uniquenesses of those applications within your data center. That translates to long, error-prone configurations, potentially. That also translates to tricks that you've had to play with hairpinning, with natting, with um, removing routing loops if you're trying to go from one virtual machine to another virtual machine in the data center. All of these things just magnify the, the complexity of your design in that data center. Now let's take a look at the right. If we can apply virtual appliances to that set of um, servers, uh, that set of virtual machines on the right. We still have a very, you know, um, robust edge device that protects against that network that's, fo that's focused on protecting that virtual infrastructure that's relegated really to those fixed configurations that are a lot less dynamic in nature. And applying the virtual appliances in front of those um, virtual machines allows you to create in essence, micro-perimeters that, that is much more focused in terms of what you're protecting on those machines. Sim it translates to simpler configurations, less errors, and more exact and precise rules that are targeted towards those applications that you're protecting. So let's, let's put together a side-by-side -side look at virtual versus physical. On the left, there are some of the attributes that we see in a virtual appliance. Installed on top of a hypervisor, right? Uh, we look at where um, it can reside anywhere in a virtual environment. Thinking about SDN and NFE, right, in terms of the virtualized world that we're moving towards, the distribution of virtualized elements is going to be across the network, whether it be edge, whether it be on customer prem, whether it be in the cloud. And having a virtual security appliance that can attach itself to that dynamic virtual environment is very, very powerful. It does translate to less performance than custom silicon hardware, right? But it, it becomes a much more focused micro-perimeter uh, protection model. So that's on the left. On the right, you know, you guys are, I'm sure, very familiar with this, right? Standalone piece of hardware, usually a fixed location within the network. Um, it bind, binds it, um, it's, it's blind to the traffic running in that virtual in, in network so that, you know, the, the adaptability becomes a, a constant challenge. Um, but it creates a very, very good hard exterior perimeter for, for your network. Now, looking at these type of elements, one thing that we look at comparing virtual and physical together is that the feature set should and functionality between the two should be no different, meaning I want to have a seamless virtual and physical network protection model. If I have to worry about feature functionality difference between my physical versus my virtual, you're going to be limited in your capabilities to get the right tool sets for security postures on your network. So that's a very important point. So looking at SDN, 
right? So what are we really trying to do here with SDM specifically? In the center, we have a pool of x86 appliances, right? They're going to be running virtual network functions, many of the ones that Jeff has alluded to at the front end of this, right? Security being at the heart of what we're talking about here. You're targeting the user groups on the right. It could be different departments with different complaints here, different rule sets that they need to work towards. It might be potentially um, different regulatory implications across these departments. So, so having how do I stitch what I'm putting in the center for a suite of virtualized network functions applied to the user group on the right? And this is where the dynamic service chain applies. Dynamic service chain is the ability to stitch together those user groups on the right with their requirements to that service group in the middle that is creating a suite of virtual night, virtualized network functions. It can be combined together where maybe you're getting virtual firewall IPS for a certain department, but maybe virtual firewall and content fil filtering for a different group. So dynamically being able to apply those rule sets to those user groups on the right is very key. That's where the STM controller and the orchestration play in. It becomes that automated programmable model to facilitate the connection between the user group and your virtual network functions in a dynamic way so you take out manual workloads away from this. Having that foundation of an automated way of stitching this together is a natural evolution to how to roll out dynamic managed services. On the left, we show deployment models associated with this, right? All of this, uh, Jeff has mentioned, is on off-the-shelf open platforms, standard x86 hardware, that we can virtualize those network functions and apply that on that open platform. So a whole host of potential managed services you can build towards your user group, giving you greater control, agility, and most importantly, simplicity to be able to roll out these services. So if you look at the available service suite here, this is what service providers would look at as their service catalog. Having a rich set of services available in that catalog becomes that they are that much more capable to address and solve the customer needs. So very important to, to be able to have an open platform to, in, your, in your SDN and NFE environment to build out those type of security services um, and leverage sort of the best of breed to be able to, to apply to that. And then automating that configuration for your user group. So really that translates benefits to the service provider is that in the blue section on the bottom right, you'll see they're able to now increase revenue. They're able to lower their OPEX in terms of managing this um, service suite to their customer and ultimately lower equipment costs, right? So they can apply the right size cost models to this um, where they're seeing service velocity. They can grow that um, with their customer demand. Where they're not seeing the demand, they can quickly spin that off in a fast fail mentality mode and reapply those resources to better services that are more profitable. Overall, really um, lowering their financial needs, reducing their risk, and gaining better success in targeting the services that matter to the user group. So with that, Jeff, back to you. Excellent. I um, want to take just a second to remind everyone to submit questions. We will reserve the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A. So uh, make sure you're submitting questions now, and we'll get to them when we do the Q&A. Um, so what I want to talk about is, is a couple of um, real use cases, um, deployment scenarios that are possible today. And um, Wayne's um, comparison of the, the virtual appliance and, and uh, and the physical appliance brought, really points to the first use case, which is an enterprise private or hybrid cloud deployment, and that's what we'll talk about first. But also uh, uh, hosting providers and public cloud offerings uh, that are that are available today, and finally um, uh, large service providers offering VCP, virtualized uh, customer premise equipment, replacing old hardware. So starting with 
the, the private and hybrid cloud use case. So this is, you know, Wayne pointed out, one thing that's really important is you need common functionality across your physical and your virtual world. And, and this private and hybrid cloud use case is really an important example of that. So here what we're talking about is, um, you know, customers got their, their own environment, their own locations, physical appliances and servers, but they're also moving um, some applications or portions of applications into a, a virtual private cloud environment. They want to be able to, de to deploy the same security functionality in both of those environments and have common policy and management. They need a way to do that. So, Wayne, if you want to talk a little bit um, about this use case and, and what the tools are that are required to make it work. Okay. Yeah, Jeff. So this is where we start to see that illustration of hybrid in its true blend of virtual and physical. So we, out on the left, we have that physical appliance protecting those physical servers potentially, and then out on the right in the cloud, we have the virtual um, virtual security appliance protecting a bank of different uh, servers for that enterprise user. Uh, potentially, again, different departments, finance to engineering to uh, regulatory, you know, issues that plague th those type of situations. Right, but having a centralized management platform that understands physical and understands virtual and all those dynamics that I mentioned earlier in terms of policies and procedures, having a, a centralized management function that can um, push those type of configurations, um, manage those type of po policies, have the visibility within your network so that if certain policies are being violated, violated you have instant alerts to that, right? That allows you to have the peace in mind that you're implementing those security policies across a hybrid environment in, in the fashion that you expect. And this is where we really yeah. see the world going in, in, in terms of that. And so um, it's really then a mixture of the right appliance with the right management model to apply to a hybrid world. Gotcha. So then in this case, what you really need is uh, virtual appliances for whatever security function you're looking for and some sort of management tool. Maybe that's a tool that comes with the virtual appliances, not necessarily a full SDN controller because the scope of the deployment and then and the number of elements you're trying to control is fairly small. So this is sort of a baby step or an enterprise step into uh, the world of SDN. Is that, is that right? Make yeah, sense? Co correct. Absolutely. It's, it, this is really focused on the security management layer and having the uh, awareness and knowledge of how to manage the security environment in a virtualized world. Aside from gotcha. the SDN controller, which we'll, we'll talk great, greatly more about. Yeah, and certainly if an enterprise wanted to get into coordinating more than just management of security in the in the private cloud, then then at some point they might start looking into SDN controllers and the ability to orchestrate more than just the security. But 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 a good starting point and probably something you can look to your security vendor alone to to provide a solution for. All right, so. Now we move into the second case, um, and this is a, this is a, a pretty easy one. Um, you know, hosting providers offering services. Um, you know, I, I think the one that comes up the most that is a really great illustration of the potential of this solution is is a customer wants to deploy some sort of standard, either website or web application, um, chooses a chooses a cloud provider, picks the 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 specs for their website or application, you know, from a menu on a screen and gets a drop down that says, would you like to protect this with web application firewall? You know, yes or no, gives them a menu of even three or four or five different vendors, web application firewalls that pick the vendor, um, answer some basic questions for configuration parameters and hit go. And they have a website or web application deployed and protected on day one with a web application firewall, all provisioned in an automated way without the hosting provider having to touch or talk to anyone and without the customer necessarily even having to talk to uh, to someone in customer service. That's not, that's not a scenario that we could have envisioned, you know, five years ago being even possible. And WAF is only one of a million different um, uh, 
services that could be deployed in this way. So talk a little bit Wayne, about the, the use case of the hosting provider and the public cloud use. Yeah, I, and I think this is one of one of a bunch of numerous very exciting type of potentials around this. You know, if if you look at those dynamic needs of those customers we've illustrated on the right, we've got four different customers here. They all may have different applications that they're protecting against. One might, one might be customer portals, one might be a unified communication, one might be a finance system. They're all going to have very specific needs of that hosting provider. And if you look at that, right, the, the ability for that hosting provider to deliver the right security elements for that application need and they being able to, with great agility, to apply new security policies to that, to be able to increase performance where they're needed in a global fashion, having that level of elasticity is going to be critical to meeting those customer needs in a, from a hosting provider perspective. And really, the, the, the way to keep up with that, that speed is through an SDN controller. Um, and that SDN controller brings uh, the ability to programmatically automate that provisioning, you know, spinning up those capabilities as they need, um, and giving the customer the uh, control over what they want to build out in that, right? And then, and then most importantly, managing that life cycle so that they still have the, the same comfort and visibility to those servers and the security issues that might arise so that they feel comfortable that they're getting what they need from that cloud. So very, very, very exciting and interesting times with this SDN controller. Excellent. All right. And then finally, we move into probably the the newest case where you could actually go out and uh, and get a trial service today, and that is the case of VCPE. And obviously, this is something that carriers are very interested in. Spend a lot of time and energy. Um, putting physical equipment on the customer premise, managing it, managing upgrades, dealing with hardware failures. Um, VCPE is this notion that you could automatically provision a piece of uh, virtual premise equipment or multiple pieces, uh, routers, um, switches, wireless, uh, and, and in this case, particularly security, um, and, and sell it on the customer premise without having to uh, ever deal with rolling a truck uh, placing a piece of specialized hardware on the customer's premise. So talk a little bit about the VCPE use case. Yeah, so we are definitely seeing uh, commercial uh, deployments of these hitting the market. And, and the reason why is that this is where the customer, the service provider is going to reap the, best, the greatest benefits, right? The, the operational complexity to manage physical hardware on a customer prem was was a daunting task, right? Lots of um, management requirements, lots of expertise. So we can centralize these capabilities in the cloud and deliver that same set of capabilities and even more to their customers. They're going to reap some great benefits. But this is where we pull in really all of the technologies we've talked about and start to blend it with um, orchestration, VNF management life cycles, um, so that we have the right level of NFB nano management and orchestration capabilities applied to an SDN architecture, applied to virtualization of security um, services. And this really ultimately translates to a, um, a, a sort of a self-care portal that the customer can come in, select all the things that they want, and through the SDN controller capabilities and the management capabilities we've talked about, being able to um, dynamically instantiate those services in a matter of minutes for those customers. So fast delivery of that and an ongoing um, life cycle management of that VNF for that customer so that they are continually evolving that to the customer needs. So this really pulls together all of the major concepts we've talked about and translates this into a, a business use case that's very, very important. Um, for service providers today. Excellent. Good. All right. Well, we're starting to run into our time for Q&A, so let's uh, talk quickly. I'm going to pass it back to Wayne to talk specifically about Juniper's offering, and then I'll wrap up and move into Q&A. So if you haven't submitted questions yet, now's your chance. We have a bunch already, um, but Wayne, uh, go ahead and uh, spend a couple minutes talking about Juniper's solution. 
Okay, Jeff. So we've talked mainly, heavily about security services here. And what I want to talk to you about is our SRX platform in a virtualized format. First and foremost, it's built upon our Juno's routing protocols and SDK. So all of the expectations you have from a, a, a routing perspective and programmability perspective translate to this virtualized environment. But from a security standpoint, we've made our security stack, our rich and extensible security stack available in this, in this virtualized format. This translates into sort of three major pillars of things. Perimeter security around your traditional firewalls, VPN, NAT, and, and, and IP routing capabilities formulate your perimeter security model. We've also added content security into this. So in that virtualized platform, you have antivirus, web filtering, content filtering, anti-spam capabilities for content-specific applications. So again, very specific to the needs of maybe certain user groups, certain de departments, and certain applications. In addition to that, we've also added application security capabilities. Um, tracking your applications, application-specific firewall rule sets, QoS models specific to an application group, and an IPS. So this suite of security capabilities allows you to pick and choose and blend the right level of security models to your user group. And all this managed really through our Juno space management platform with security director and virtual director um, allows you to orchestrate these capabilities the way we've talked about in the use cases in a fashion that your customers would expect and allow you to dynamically address to the needs of that customer as, they're, as, as they grow, as they um, expand security policies, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is a very powerful platform, really, to build out those micro perimeters that we talked about earlier and apply this to a very specific rule set. Next is really our Juniper NSD solution architecture. Right? Um, we have taken really much of what the Etsy um, definitions are for Juniper uh, for NFE and applied those into a very Juniper specific architecture. So let's start off really with it, and this provides you that end to end system to deliver NFE solutions. So let's start off with the hardware platforms at the bottom. This constructs your, your NFE infrastructure composed of gateways that bring your traffic into the network, applying a service control gateway logic to, um, to look at that traffic, apply the right policies, and formulate the right routing paths for that traffic group. Um, so you can really create those service chains that we talked about. We also have our Metafabric reference architecture that begins your foundational elements for routing security and switching to build up your um, cloud infrastructure uh, for NFE. Moving to the right, we have management and orchestration components to help you go through the SDN uh, controller aspects of it, as well as our integration with partners for um, um, orchestration and VNF management life cycles. Then moving to really the application and services. Juniper has a rich family of virtual network functions enabled through the virtual SRX and BMX platforms. So you have a whole suite of routing and security and a broad range of other Juno space VNFs that you can, um, you can instantiate. And with an open platform that gives you the ability to integrate the best of breed of other third-party virtual network functions. All this really wrapped around management and Juniper professional services to help you deliver to this, this to the market. Greater integration also with BSS and OSS, whether that be existing or new, um, new, new partners that you're integrating with. All this really focused on solving specific use cases in the market. We talked about virtual CPE, but there's a whole host of other type of use cases that I'm only giving a sampling of that you can start to solve for use cases in, in the marketplace with this. You know, virtual security service is obviously the major focus here that we're talking about in this, in this particular webinar. Okay, Jeff, and with that, back to you. 
Great. So we'll just I'll just wrap this up quickly and then get to Q and A. So really, the, the the key points to take away are everybody's looking at this stuff. I mean, you saw thirty percent. Uh, about a third were beginning the education process and a, and a quarter starting to kind of kick the tires on solutions. Um, I, I think that's true around the world for enterprises and, and service providers, and, and many of the large providers are a little bit ahead of that even um, in production or proof of concept now. Um, security is one of the very first network services that was virtualized, and there's a wide range of solutions available today. So if you're if you're looking at starting somewhere, security is a great place to start because there are fairly mature solutions available, and real deployment cases are here. Um, whether it's a, a public private cloud enterprise deployment, a, a hosting provider looking to offer innovative dynamic services, or a big carrier uh, using this technology to deploy uh, VCPE, and ultimately to virtualize their entire infrastructure, which is what we're what we're moving towards. So with that, I just want to move right into the Q and A, and we have uh, we have a lot of questions here. <coughs> some of them, uh, Juniper or I will follow up with you specifically. We have some pretty detailed, uh, specific solution questions, um, but but um, we have a bunch of good questions. The first one is, does VCPE or the VCPE use case make sense for the consumer or most more likely the small business space? What do you think, Wayne? I have my opinion. So, but. well, I'll, I'll take an initial run at that, Jeff. So, virtual CPE, beauty of this cloud based application model is it allows itself to ex extend itself to solve a, a whole suite of um, targeted user groups from consumer to small business to larger enterprises with many branches associated with their uh, deployment models, um, even to, uh, you know, cable and mobile user groups. So it really allows itself to extend that IP VPN connectivity model with a suite of um, connections into cloud data centers and applying the right security services associated with those. Um, it, it really has a broad target group mix. Where we're seeing the, the, the greatest traction, though, is around business virtual CP at the get-go, but it, it will quickly extend itself to a broader user group, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. I, I would say that it's uh, there are compelling reasons for service providers to deliver VCPE into the small business space, and there are compelling reasons for a large company to look at VCPE for for large um, deployments of you know remote and branch sites. So I I think definitely uh, it's applicable to everybody. All right, so we have the next question. Um, Someone who's uh, auto, uh, automated continuous monitoring, um, how, how can we adjust, how do we plan to adjust uh, virtual security controls via, via automated policy? So what's the, um, what does automation look like uh, for virtual appliances and virtual security solutions? Yeah, so really it's the linkage between your management layer functions and your SDN controllers as well as your um, virtual network function appliances um, that you're, you're, you're building out. So really to keep up with the security threats that are happening in, in the marketplace, you know, uh, being able to uh, aggregate threat feeds from uh, multiple locations and keeping up with the current states of those, being able to assess those and translate those into actionable steps on your security on your security appliances, right, whether virtual or physical. And then automating that implementation of those aggregated threats into actions um, in, in a programmable way to instruct your uh, firewalls or IPSs or whatnot to, to take hold of those, right? And if there is a necessity, let's say, for the analytics that shows, well, I, 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 th these threats are really starting to bottleneck my network. I need to um, elastically grow the, the perimeter seek security a bit to be able to dynamically spin those type of um, appliances up in a virtualized way and uh, build more capacity to handle more threats, all with the focus of keeping your data center you know, with business continuity. Excellent. And, you know, really the more 
um, the more elements of the network that you have uh, under control, the more powerful the potential for automation is. The more information feeds you're taking, the more um, components you're able to correlate with each other, the more powerful once you get into automation um, your, the solution can be. So I think we're just really starting to scratch the surface of what we can do uh, with automation for uh, security in a, in a virtualized environment. Um, here's an interesting question. This is one that I get a lot too. Is what will be the last stand use cases for physical security appliances? Or another way to say it is, will there always be a need for for hardware appliances? Um, I, I don't see. I'll start. I don't see hardware appliances um, likely ever going away. There are, there are certain functions within security that require specialized hardware for performance. There are deployment cases where physical appliances um, will still be advantageous for uh, performance reasons, um, and so I, I think they'll co I think they'll coexist um, uh, until sort of specialized infrastructure in general is completely gone. And I think we're years and years away from that. I would say if you look hard enough, you can probably still find a token ring network out there. So um, I don't think they'll ever disappear. Um, but I think the opportunity for growth, a lot of the opportunity for growth is in, in uh, the virtualized appliance. What do you think, Wayne? Yeah, I totally agree with you, Jeff, in that there, there are attributes that virtualization models apply itself well. Speed, elasticity, uh, velocity of rolling out new services, they all are very much tied to the attributes of, of virtualization. If we look at a service that has proven itself in the marketplace, for instance, right, and requires a price to performance element to, to, to scale, then physical at some point cross, it crosses an intersection. And we've done some studies on this where with rack space and power and so forth, there is a certain point where physical becomes a, a, a better investment towards price and performance to protect high high and high demand services and so forth so there is a boundary to this and that's why we still continue to see a blend of virtual and physical and that's why also the importance of virtual and physical appliances having equivalent feature sets so you don't have to be forced to decide let the market conditions decide for you and then you can pick and choose the right platform excellent um all right, so here's a question. How do we expect to see um, security and SDN and NFB solutions evolving over time? So, you know, where we're at today is kind of virtual appliance versions of the existing security products that we're used to, um, uh, working with SDN controller and orchestration solutions. But what do, what do you think looking out two or three or four years? How, how are the solutions going to evolve, do you think? I think this is where it gets really, truly exciting, right? It, where we are right now is getting into commercial deployments for those low-hanging fruit items that clear, clearly make great business sense, right? IPVPN, firewall, virtualizing those in, in a virtual CPE use case. Where this evolves is, is where it really gets exciting, building that foundation that allows you to have an open, flexible, evolvable sort of SDN and NFE platform for service creation really doesn't force you to make that decision now. So that, that's what I would say is, is really most important is choosing that platform that allows you to evolve and then allows you uh, the, the possibilities to experiment, right? Uh, that whole notion of spinning up VNFs to test out the market in a, in a quick and agile way. And if it takes off, then you can, you can focus on that and, ex and expand that. If it doesn't, you can quickly fast fail. But I think where we're going to see specific um, evolution of this is, is in the next year or two is to expand the security services, uh, expand things like WAN acceleration, uh, CDN, you know, things that are really starting to expand upon that virtual CPU use case. And then over time, um, I, I think uh, we're, we're going to see a lot of creative new services being developed in the marketplace. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I also think that, you know, this, the notion of a, of a security appliance that is, you know, functionally the same as its physical counterpart is something that might change over time as well, where, where what we'll look at as a, a, a say, a virtual firewall today, which may have, be able to deliver 
five or 10 or 12 different unique security services, those services could all end up being de decoupled and each one being its own essentially virtual appliance or virtual service. And, and we lose the notion of the, of the multifunction firewall and just look at the specific services that that firewall delivers as individual um, solutions to be uh, deployed and managed by the FDN infrastructure. So, so we're in a transitional period now where people want to see um, the same um, you know, management interface architecture as, the, as what they have in the physical world, but that could certainly change over time as things move more and more to the virtual world. Well, it looks like we are at the top of the hour here. Um, we do have uh, a few more questions that we weren't able to get to. We will follow up with folks individually to make sure those questions get answered. Um, but I'd like to thank everybody and thank Wayne for joining. And I'm going to pass it back to, uh, to Joanne to finish her final uh, wrap-up items. Um, so Joanne, take it away. Yep. Thanks, Jeff. And, and as you mentioned, great job for Jeff and Wayne. Good discussion. And uh, I did see questions coming in right to the end there. Um, so for the audience, we will, uh, as, as Jeff mentioned, there will be some follow-up direct. So thanks, thanks to the audience for participating here. Thanks for joining us. And uh, special thanks to Juniper Networks for partnering uh, on the webinar, on the content, and participating here. Um, uh, so everyone is aware this webinar will be available shortly for archive viewing, so you'll receive a follow-up email with more information there. Um, so please come back in and view this content or share it with your colleagues um, if, it, if it was of value to you. Um, also look for more webinar topics from the IHS Infonetics team. Uh, we hope to have you join us back soon. And, and also you'll be seeing a, a survey pop up here after the webinar. We'd love to get your feedback, so fill that out and, um, and submit that to us, and we'll be looking for that. So again, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your, great rest of your day. Bye-bye.